Why don't we start off with something very recent, unexpected, Tony Scott? Well, yes, Unstoppable. I, unstoppable, which is actually, you know, I was thinking... It's such an ironically last... titled movie now. I it? know, yeah. Um, but it's actually a very enjoyable, really great action film, something that he was really great at. And I don't know, now, was he working, or was he think was it Top Gun 2 really going to happen? Was, was that the... Top, Top Gun 2, was he was uh, scouting locations with Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise was with him just the day before, I think. Right, okay. Uh, he went to one of the bases. Uh, you know, he was with him. Yeah, okay, no, because that's a, I mean, look, it's, it's not, like you said, it's, you know, it was for, for at least for us, it was unexpected. Um... And if you're going to look at that as the last film, Unstoppable, that is a, that is an, I think, given the films that he made, it's and his style, and that was perfect. Film. <laughs> yeah, know. it's a really yeah. good movie. It was, yeah, I think I think it was a good movie for him. I mean, he, he mm-hmm. did a lot of movies with mixed results, but even when they weren't great, there they was were Tony little, Scott films. Yeah, the unmistakable Tony Scott style. Yeah. It, you, you either hated it, or you were turned on by it. I mean, a lot of times I thought it was too much. Right. But then, then I'd look at it and say, you know, but then again, I mean, he's reaching. I mean, these are, at their very core, they're highly commercial films that right. are extremely experimental. And and I think that very few directors experimented as much as Tony Scott with the visual language. Oh, well, look at Domino. For, I mean, Domino is like full. I mean... He doesn't even know what he wants to do in Domino. Ilya Kazan's The Last Tycoon uh, from 76. Robert De Niro playing, nominally playing um, Stahlberg. It's a incomplete screenplay, uh, or uh, it's a screenplay based on an incomplete story by, uh, by F. Scott Fitzgerald. It's got a great supporting cast. It, it, it's not completely successful, but it is uh, an uh, a very very interesting final film ca- from Kazan, and it's very interesting because it has De Niro in the lead. Yeah, so, and it's a great opportunity too to see De Niro and Nicholson share the screen together. Exactly. Um, you know, and also it's, it's so ironic that we're bringing up Kazan when Ann Harris is on the show because I remember vividly when De Niro and Scorsese presented Kazan with the honorary Oscar, whatever year that was. And uh, it was very controversial, and there are a lot of people standing up to clap, and then there are a lot of people that were staying seated. And Ed Harris was one that would not stand up and clap for him. Right, he, I remember that. He, yeah. he had a very intense expression on his face, like he was not in, in I remember the, that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, my next one is uh, is Martin Ritt's last movie, also with uh, mm-hmm. with Robert De Niro and with Jane Fonda, yeah. Stanley and Iris. Oh yeah, mm. and um, and I know that uh, I know that our guest talks about that film as well. Yeah, Martin Ritz in his book, and he was friends with Martin Ritz. Um, that's an interesting movie. That's the movie where De Niro is dys- dyslexic, or, or yeah. he's illiterate. Yeah. He's illiterate, and right. uh, Jane Jane Fonda teaches him to read, and they kind of start an aff- an affair. Um, and also, I, I still own the musical score for that. John Williams did the score wow. for that. And yeah. I remember vividly a, a conversation that he has under a tree with a with a kid, where where the kid talks about De Niro's father just died, and the kid's yeah. talking about when he gets scared, he he likes to turn on the light and leave the light on at night. And De Niro makes a comment like, "My father was my light." And that's one of those movie conversations that have always stuck with me, that moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Martin Ritt was really great at, like, uh, you know, people people don't talk about Martin Ritt as being one of the great directors, but he was really terrific at getting, in, getting into the heart of what, what uh, all kinds of people are thinking and feeling at, mm-hmm. at certain moments. And, uh, and uh you know i mean when you when you think about conrack or or hud or um or or sounder uh right. i mean those those are all great like little people movies you know and those right. those are my favorite kinds of movies you know um mm-hmm. and uh you know Stanley and Iris was not 
was not hugely, you know, uh, talked about in the year that it came out in '89. It 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 wasn't it wasn't a big, uh, you know, awards right. you know, getter or anything like that. But it did it did um, pair together two great icons of uh, movies uh, in their only time together. Uh, in film, and, and I think that's that's worthy of, of discussion, you know. Um, yeah. And I think Martin Ritt is worthy of discussion just in general, you know. Um, <laughs> my next one is somebody who only did one one movie before this, uh, before his film uh, that that made him really huge, and then he passed away, and it was such a shock. Uh, and that's Steve Gordon. Yeah. Um, and of course, the only movie he made was Arthur. When that movie hit, I remember uh, being a, being a kid, you know, being a teenager, and thinking, "This guy is going to be huge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he is just going to be huge." That movie well, because he so wrote, funny. he wrote and directed that, and and it it was hysterical. That still mm-hmm. still remains one of my favorite comedies. Oh yeah, it's a great uh, film, and, and it's got a lot of heart too. I mean, the, the courtesy of John Gilgood, you know, it's a great film actually. It, I mean, I've got a couple of other like people like Charles Lawton or uh, who did Night of the Hunter, yeah, his only film, or Leonard Castle who only did the uh, Honeymoon Killers in 1970. Uh, Leonard Castle was a was a musician really, and. Uh, He's the one that uh, wrote and directed The Honeymoon Killers in 1970, which was going to be uh, Martin Scorsese's debut film, but he actually got fired from <laughs> I think he, he got fired or let go or whatever. I don't know exactly what happened, but but uh, but Leonard Castle, the writer, actually came in and directed the movie, and it actually became uh, one of the movies that uh, Francois Truffaut, actually picked as one of his ten favorite American films. And then then we have Fred Zinneman, whose last film was Five Days, One Summer, 1982. That's on my list. That's on my list. <laughs> Which is one of the great Sean Connery performances. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, a, it's about mountain climbing and... Uh, it's you know it's been years since I've seen it to tell you the truth. I think it's been like so, twenty years since I've seen it, so I, I yeah. don't remember much about it. I remember that came out about the time as wrong as right, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, another, another yeah. John Connery movie that exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah, almost um, maybe even the same year. Um, you know, I've got a, a Call Dreyer's last movie, Gertrude from '64. Which is often uh, often picked as one of the great films, like in, in that sort of sight and sound kind of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And then now here's a, here's one that we all have something to say about. Sergio Leone's last uh, Once Upon a Time in America. And that wasn't the, that wouldn't have been the last film. That's what's so sad about that. There was the great movie that he was going to make about the siege of Leningrad that never... Um, and then there was another film about the American Civil War, I think, too. I mean, there were like two... And, you know, we haven't seen the final version of Once Upon a Time in America. That's what really... You know, it's it's coming. This, I mean, it's coming. It's coming. Every time I think I've watched the whole thing, then a couple of years later, oh, there's more footage. It's like a mad, mad, mad world. There's more footage. There's more footage. <laughs> God yeah. forbid they find Berlin Alexander plots. There's more. Oh, this is an episode we never showed on German television. Um, yeah, it's going to be 18 hours now. Well, I mean, that, that, that's one of those occasions where it's a very fitting final film, especially oh, it since, is. especially since that was a movie that he dreamt about for so long, and he finally got to do it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, very tragically. It, wasn't uh, allowed to be released as he wanted it to be. No, that's the second time that which, happened to him. It which is definitely, which definitely something that probably contributed to his death. Yeah. I've got uh, <laughs> Louis Benwell's last movie, That Obscure Object of Desire from 1977. Yeah. What a great a last good, film. What a great last movie that is. His, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that whole sort of, 
battle between you know Fernando Ray and and uh, and the female in that in that movie. Is that Carol, know, Carol Bouquet? Uh, yes, uh, I couldn't remember her name. Sorry, thank you. But uh, uh, just 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 a great great final sort of. Uh, uh, that's a great like for sort of an old old man kind of movie. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, I watched that after nine eleven. And what a crazy film and what an appropriate film to watch. I watched it, I guess, a couple months after 9-11 because there's a lot of terrorism, <laughs> like, in that movie. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's he was on to something, that's for sure. I mean, not, not just about 9-11, but it really captured the mood right, of the time it was made and everything. Um, it's a fascinating yeah. movie. Okay, my next one is uh, Joseph L. Mankiewicz's last film from 1972, Sleuth. <laughs> Yeah, which is also oh, yeah. a great old man kind of movie because it's really about like a uh, an older older you know genius writer battling a young punk. <laughs> and that was remade, wasn't it? With um, Jude Law, it was and, uh, with with Kane in the uh, Olivier role. Uh, Olivier right. was the older older gentleman in the in the first movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Kane as the punk, and then and then later on it was it was Kane as the older uh, as the old writer, and then it was what Jude Law. Jude Law, yeah, it was Jude, Jude Law. Law, directed by Kenneth Branagh. Yep. Yeah, right. that was an interesting. It's an interesting remake. I mean, it's not a great film, but it's interesting though. It's, the it's, um, sty- it's stylish enough. It's yeah. very stylish. Yeah, but I love I love Sleuth from seventy two. Oh yeah, it's an awesome I mean, film. It's a very interesting movie for Mankiewicz to to make too, because you know it's it's so it feels so British, you know, and uh, it, it 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 doesn't feel like the kind of movie that a an American filmmaker should. I'm sure he. Would be making. I'm, sh- I'm sure he just saw, probably saw it on the stage and said, you know, I'd like to make that into a movie and did yeah. it that way, you yeah. know. Well, he came really from, opened it up. Point. He opened it up really well, and he actually got a, a best director nomination that year. Surprisingly so. I mean, it got a he got two best actor nominations from the Oscars, and it actually got a best director nomination and 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 I think a nomination for his score. But you know what? I always something. I I always get uh, I don't get them confused because I know what each movie is. But I all Sleuth is always synonymous with to me with Death Trap. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe it's the whole mystery writer slash mm-hmm. Michael Caine connection, right, and, right. And of course, Death Trap also came from a stage play, and it's a Sidney Lumet movie. Right. Mm-hmm. It all ties in. It's a good stage and I, play. And I starred in Death play. Trap. Actually, I did a, th- a theatrical production of it. I what part did you? Reeve. What did part did you play? The Christopher Reeve part. Uh, oh wow! <laughs> and and the whole uh, kind of <laughs> slightly veiled. Gay subplot. <laughs> yeah, uh, that that was interesting to play yeah. <laughs> with an old was. man that was that I and I did it opposite an old man that was actually a closeted homosexual, and he was he he was highly highly uh, uncomfortable playing the gay moments in front of it. Oh, oh, interesting. My next movie is called is David Lean's Passage to India. Uh, which I still think is a great movie. I still think that it uh, it resonates. As uh, uh, I I don't I don't think that it's a lesser David Lean movie. I think it's one of his greats. Um, and uh, and it's really amazing to me too that he he wasn't just the director and the writer and the producer, but he was also the editor of the movie. In fact, he well, that's how he got his for, start. That's yeah, how he got his start. So, I thought so that he, was interesting. He, He's one of the few uh, people who's been nominated for four Oscars in one year uh, for Patrick Sandia. So, and uh, and plus that that movie is so mysterious and weird. And, and what does she uh, see in the caves? What the hell does she? What is it in the caves? What the hell? I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know, but I love John Boehner. I mean, what the hell does she see in the caves? <laughs> That movie keeps that mystery going, you yeah. know, and uh, and I like that. I like that that choice. Um, 
Uh, okay, so now we're getting into my top ten, and and uh, and here I would pick Robert Mulligan. This would be one of my most obscure ones. Robert Mulligan, the director of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and The Other and and uh, and uh, Fear Strikes Out and so many other great movies. His last movie was The Man in the Moon from 1991, yeah. oh, uh, which was okay. which was one of uh, which was if not I think it was the debut performance by Reese, Reese Witherspoon, mm. uh, where she plays. I think a, you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. When she plays a young girl who falls in love with a uh, with a farmhand who is is killed tragically, and, and she has to get over that. And, um, yeah, that, that's a that nice movie. movie. That got good reviews too. I'm trying to think was was George Roy Hill's last movie Funny Farm? Yeah, it was. That is it. That is. I have that. I wrote that down on my my one of these cards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was a movie. A it movie was that indeed. was acclaimed. Upon its release, I, actually, critics really liked it, and I liked it too. And and even rarer for a Chevy Chase movie to get good reviews around that time. Yeah, yeah sure. it was already on the downward. We're already on the downward spiral um, there. I mean, yeah. So that was that was that was a good that and yeah that was a good um, film. I remember watching that. You know, rent it on the what is the, Chev- what is the Chevy Chase movie where he snorts? The uh, the voodoo guy comes in because he's possessed and he snorts it like cocaine. Modern problems, isn't it? Modern modern, modern, yeah, modern, modern, modern problems, problems. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. It's like eighty three or something. I remember that movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. before I think eighty or eighty one. Yeah, or eighty two yeah. maybe. I don't. Dabney Coleman was in that too, right? I always remember oh. the commercials on HBO and yeah. him coming up after snorting the cocaine and going, yeah. "I like it." <laughs> so, cool. I always, oh, oh, I love that. I cool. always remember that. Okay, right. so one of the great, seriously, one of the great last movies, and I remember seeing this in the theater and thinking, "Oh my God, this has to be his last movie." It, it's just, it's just too, it's just too perfect not to, not to be his last movie, and that's Robert Altman's *A Prayer yeah. Young Companion*. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. No, it's a good movie. Very good movie. Uh, you know. Well, Prairie when, Home Companion. You know, it, it, it definitely fit in his mold. I I can't imagine another director being more uh, more apropos to to do a rendition of Garrison Keillor's show than he was because he's the as a director. I mean, he's the very definition of an ensemble uh, guy. Okay. Um, yeah. And apparently he was. I mean, he did when he did Kansas City. He was very sick, and I think he got the heart transplant after Kansas City. Um, and and then Prairie Home Companion, they wouldn't insure him unless they had a backup director on set. And that was P. T. Anderson. Yeah, stayed with him all the way through, and, and P. T. Anderson, I'm sure, learned learned a lot from him being on set. Yeah. I mean, but uh, you know, all the talk of death in that with you know, with, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, with uh with Virginia Madsen as the as the angel of death in it and and just that that incredible last scene in the diner, uh and uh with part of the cast including uh Kevin Klein and Meryl Streep in there and uh you just I just sat there, you know, just going, Oh, <laughs> And it seemed, it seemed completely unbelievable that Meryl Streep hadn't worked with Altman before that. I mean, they hadn't, yeah. had they? Yeah. They yeah. had not. Yeah. Mm. So it was it was amazing. Uh, another another of my favorite uh, last movies is Louis Malle's Vanya on 42nd Street from 1994. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's, that was his last. Yeah, I remember. I, remember, I saw that in the theater, actually, yeah. That was just uh, again, you know, it was a, a somewhat of a revisitation with uh, to uh, another one of his great movies, uh, My Dinner with Andre, mm-hmm. which also had Andre Gregory, uh, and also uh, included uh, Wallace Shawn in it. It's just, it's just an amazing, amazing movie. I think that's also on Criterion as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, another Criterion selection that uh, I think this is on Criterion is Andrei Tarkovsky's last movie, The Sacrifice, uh, from 1986, directed by, by Tarkovsky and uh, and photographed by Sven Nightfist. 
it is it is absolutely one of those movies that you when you first saw it uh, when I first saw it I absolutely knew this is this is this is a movie about uh, this is a movie made by somebody at the end of their life you know uh, I just I just absolutely could feel it um, it's one of those few movies uh, you know and now we're getting into and watching movies. and watching Solaris I felt like I was at the end of my life. <laughs> well, I know you're a Janani Tarkovsky fan uh, because you know I, I know that his movies are very, very. Slow yeah, he's a, and, he's an acquired boredom, actually. Yes, yeah, I understand that. I understand that, and that's brave of you to say that. But <laughs> but the sacrifices are really, really great movie, and actually, it's my favorite of Tarkovsky's movies. Um, then we get into Bergman. Bergman's last movie from 2003, Sarah Band. Yeah. Was, yeah, I is, saw that, that. Okay, is that is that is that technically his last film? Because when you look on IMDb, there's something after that. I was looking earlier, and there's something after that, and I've never even heard of it. Um, well, I'm gonna look it up right now, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's his last movie. Like, no, um, I saw no, I, it is. I, but I, I, and that's what I was thinking. But then I saw something listed after that, Dean, and I, that's why I'm. But I was, yeah, definitely, would, that's a, and that's a great film. I mean, that's oh, just well, awesome. you, you might be looking at the writer thing. Uh, I might but, be. That gets confused. I would put director first. I hate when they do that, when they put, like, writer or producer. No, put director first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, 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 that's the writer thing. You know, as a director, his last, uh, his last. well, he did he did a TV movie called uh, Spotkinson, which I don't yeah, know yeah, what yeah. that is. Uh, but, no, I have no idea. You know, I never even heard of that. <laughs> Well, yeah. Sarah Bond was a TV movie too. Yeah, Sarah Bond yeah, was a TV movie, but it was it was theatrically released. So yeah. uh, you know that's that's why that's why I put Sarah. Well, Bond uh, you know, as and, was and other TV was, movies that he did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, then, uh, but Sarah Bond is great. It's a uh, it, mm-hmm. it's something that it, it's something that really feels like a last movie because it's mm-hmm. it's a revisit, revisitation to those two characters that were in scenes from a marriage played by right, right. Josephson and uh and Lee Oldman. Uh Peter Yates is uh, the la- a separate piece from two thousand and four. Uh James Wales, They Dare Not Love from forty one. Robert Aldrich is all the marbles from eighty one. Yeah, then I wrote that down. I was like, Oh my god, <laughs> yeah. that was his last movie. Oh my god. Yeah. John Cassavetti's Big Trouble, nineteen eighty six. Right. Uh Robert Wise's Rooftops from eighty nine. Mm-hmm. Uh, Leo McCary's Satan Never Sleeps from 62. Uh, Preston Sturgis, The French, They Are a Funny Race, 55. Uh, Eric Von Stroheim's The Hello Sister from 33. Uh, D.W. Griffith's The Struggle, 31. Um, Antonioni's Beyond the Clouds with Vim Vendors, 95. Well, wait, uh, is that his, what about the, the, the short film in Eros that he does, that well, anthology? Well, I, I try and keep all the short films out of this, you know. I'm okay. just trying to keep it to, to, okay. to okay. features. Um, uh, Carol Reed, The uh, Public Eye uh, from 72. Uh, Victoria De Sica's The Voyage, 74. Uh, Jean Renoir's The Little Theater of Jean Renoir, 1970. Howard Hawks' Rio Lobo, 1970. Stanley Donan's uh, Blame It on Rio, 1984. Wow. Uh, 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 he's still alive. Isn't he? Is, isn't he still alive? He's still alive. He's still alive, but yeah. he's not making movies. <laughs> okay, so, but uh, Akira Kurosawa's Montadayo, 1983. That's not that bad. That's in 1993. Yeah. That's not a bad film, though. I, I, I I'm like not saying that. that these are bad movies, but I'm just saying that they are lesser movies. Uh, I thought Grass Kurosawa... City in August was his last movie. No, no, he no, made another. You know, he made another yeah. one. <laughs> I thought that too. <laughs> um, Charlie Chaplin's *The Countess from Hong Kong*, '67. Uh, Francois Truffaut's *Confidentially Yours*, 1983. Billy Wilder's *Buddy Buddy*, 1981. That yeah. is the one. Okay. Yep. <laughs> this is now one of the greatest filmmakers who ever lived. He makes really one bad film, one bad film, and cannot get another gig. Yeah, that is no, but that's this is very serious. This guy makes one 
bad film. I mean, I'm not saying Fedora and the other the some of the ones we put in our masterpieces. But this is the one you're gonna you're gonna crucify this guy for this yeah. movie. You're out of your mind. That was yeah, one was, of the greatest uh, injustices uh, ever done. Yeah, in a different era. I mean, a different era of people that took over Hollywood that didn't care about the old Hollywood. Right. Exactly. They, they they didn't value the knowledge that they had or or what they could gain from them. They just wanted to pave their own way, and they kind of elbowed them out. You know. Well, but they sort of made an example out of him. They made him the yeah, poster boy they did. almost. They, exactly, mm-hmm. they did. That's so true. That's that's exactly that's exactly right. You and can't he wanted to make movies. Better. He wanted yeah. to make movies still. I mean, there was tons of there were tons of movies left in him. Yeah, it's that's that's one of the fattest yeah. uh, examples of this. Uh, Hal Ashby, Eight Million Ways to Die. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, but a notable for Andy Garcia though, or whatever that's worth today. Yeah. He's well, and it, yeah. What I always wanted, I always wanted, and that'll never happen. And uh, I always wanted to see what his director's cut would have been of Eight Million Ways to Die because he didn't get to touch that movie really in editing. And the thing mm-hmm. that shocks me about executives and studios and their uh, misuse of Hal Ashby was they didn't value his post-production sense. Uh, they just saw the way he shot movies, and they thought it was very lazadaisical that – no one was going on a script, and Mark Mark Damon, who produced Eight Million Ways to Die, and who was a guest on the show, mm-hmm. uh, there was a lot of bad blood between Mark Damon and Hal Ashby. He decided to give Ashby a chance after years of drug abuse and bad bad stories from the sets of Ashby movies about his behavior. He decided to give him a chance on Eight Million Ways to Die. He had an Oliver Stone script. They had Robert Town come in and do rewrites. So he had the two most electrifying screenwriters in the business that worked on the script. Then he'd go to the set, and Hal Ashby wasn't shooting the script. Um, he was letting actors kind of find their way and improvise scenes and all this kind of stuff. And Mark Damon, as somebody that was a penny pincher and a producer on the project, really uh, didn't like that at all. And he'd find Hal Ashby smoking weed and that kind of stuff. But the actors adored him. Like Andy right. Garcia and Rosanna Arquette and Jeff Bridges, they uh-huh. all went to bat for him. There's actually that scene in The Big Lebowski when Jeff Bridges and John Goodman go up to throw Donnie's ashes to the ocean, and the ashes like fly back in Jeff Bridges' face. Um, th- that's in that movie because that happened to Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges went out with friends with Hal Ashby's ashes uh-huh. out in the ocean. And th- and threw the ashes, and they flew back <laughs> at everyone's <laughs> face, and it was almost like, yeah, that's something Hal would do. <laughs> it's like <laughs> at the very, you know, and and I, I I'm really, you know, there's the great story of looking to get out, which we covered, which was another film that got taken from him, and he secretly made a director's cut and gave it to UCLA, and then it was unearthed, and they premiered it and released it on DVD finally, <laughs> a much better film. I mean, the studios came in and absolutely massacred a lot of his latter stuff. Right. Um, but also, he was extremely self-destructive. Yeah. Uh, and he kind of destroyed himself in a lot of ways. And the movies reflected that. I mean, The Slugger's Wife and that kind of stuff, you you think, God, Hal, what are you doing after such a breakthrough of films in the 70s? And also, uh, and one of his most famous films, Shampoo, he didn't even really direct that. I mean, the Warren Beatty kind of took that one over. Right, yeah. He just sat yeah. on the sidelines. Right, yeah. You know who he originally wanted to star in, Harold and Maude? Who he approached for Harold and Maude? Who? Elton John. He wanted Elton John to play the male lead in that. And that would have Elton, changed movie history. <laughs> Elton John absolutely wanted to do it, but his music career his music career was just taking off, so he said, I gotta do this music thing. I gotta follow this through. Yeah. Wow. That would have changed movie history if you ask me. Um, and when he died, when he died or he died like a I think of a liver cancer or something, uh, the person that recognized that and took him to the hospital the first time was Warren Beatty. And uh, he blamed Warren Beatty for a surgery that he felt got botched that led to his quick death. Uh, And he never talked to Warren Beatty again. They were on the outs near the end. Mm -hmm. It's just the whole whole thing is is 
He's tragic, to tragic talk life. about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Too ridiculous, ridiculously sad. Um, uh, okay, so here's some other names here uh, who you know did movies that didn't hit. Uh, William Wyler, The Liberation of L. B. Jones. I don't even remember this movie. I, I was looking <laughs> researching that earlier, and I, I was yeah. like, "What? I know the I know the title. I've never seen it." Um, yeah, I've never seen it either. Uh, John Frankenheimer, uh, technically his last big screen movie was Reindeer Games with oh. with Ben Affleck uh, two, in 2000. But he did a TV movie. He hopped back and forth between TV and and But the TV and, movie uh, is actually movie. very – Was that yeah, Past the, the War? Yeah, uh, that's a superb with, movie. Um, that's that yeah, was Michael great, Gambon as Lyndon Johnson. As LBJ, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So – uh, so that's that's an interesting sort of like uh, sort of like split there in, in in some ways. John Hughes's last movie was Curly Sue, 1991. Uh, Lucio Fulci's Door to Silence, 1991. Nicholas Ray's We Can't Go Home Again, 1976, which I saw at the New York Film Festival, and I said, Oh my God, this is terrible! I can't even sit. What is that about, by the way? What is that about, Dean? It's really just him. Uh, it's really kind of strange to say that it's his last movie because he was teaching at an upstate New York um, university, and mm-hmm. he gave the cameras over to his uh, to his charges, and they filmed the movie, and he really sort of edited it together into some kind of mess that uh, just uh, you know. Some people have good things to say about it. I can't have anything good to say about it at all. Okay, all right. That's uh, but anyone who wants to watch a great Nicholas Ray movie, Criterion's Bigger Than Life. It's um, Bigger amazing. Than Life. Yeah. That's, that's, that's maybe my favorite. You know what? Movie. I think I saw... Uh, who, I, was it Vin Vendors that did the uh, a movie about Nicholas Ray? Like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a Vin uh, Vendors like, movie. Like it's a documentary. Yeah. And And Nicholas Ray is dying. Yeah, and, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And he's sitting there, and he's like, "Oh my God, I'm so sick." And, and he is in the process of dying. That movie captures that. That that, that might be uh, one and only time that that's been captured. Uh, something like that. Uh, the last one, Bob Fosse, Star 80, 1983. You know, I mean, of course, he wasn't expecting to die uh, of a heart attack, even though. He kind of predicted it uh, with all that jazz, and but with Star Eighty, you know, you get the true sense of like uh, of like his sort of disgust and his sort of and his fascination with all of the uh, glamorous and all of the most horrific things about uh, stardom. You know, when he passed away, I remember being in. Uh, I was working at the Atlanta Journal Constitution as a uh, as a as a copy boy, <laughs> actually, and I was there. I was there to bring photos from uh, that were coming over the wire to uh, to the editors of uh, the newspaper at the time, and uh, that was just one of the things I had to do. And I still remember the photo of uh, Bob Fosse coming over. The wire, uh, uh, and I, I said, "Oh my God, Bob Fosse is gone." I, you know, I can still feel it. You know, um, yeah, Fosse was amazing, and Star Eighty is a tough movie, and it's as tough as any other movie that he made. Uh, the next one, Christoph Kowalski, Three Colors Red. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's definitely. <laughs> I mean. That's insane to think that that was his last film because that was the movie that really uh, that and the other two films in the Three Colors uh, you know, trilogy were the movies that really broke him. I thought mm-hmm. you know? uh, people really knew his name right at the end of his career. You know, but my very favorite movie, my very favorite last film, the one that's absolutely perfect. That's absolutely the one is John Hughes's The Dead. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, That's a good choice. Know, a very good choice. If you look at The Dead, you know, and 
you just feel all the emotion, you know. Well, uh, it's made by a man family. who knows. He's, uh, it's yeah. made by a man who knows he's reaching the end. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's that's the pers- that's the feeling you get of the movie. It's meant to be his swan song, and it's one of the few out of any of the directors that we mentioned that actually their last movie actually is that. You know, it's their last right. movie because they can't they they won't live anymore and they know it. Yeah. Well, good. I'm so glad we ended the show on a good note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a question. We mentioned family plot. No, we didn't. But uh, yeah, I mean, we mentioned fam- uh, we mentioned Hitchcock and family plot in this interview. But uh, Hitchcock is amazing to me because, uh, uh, and, and what I talked to Nat about is the, the the need to stay relevant as you get older. Uh, that never applied more to me than with Hitchcock. Because people were trying to exceed him at his own game. I mean, he invented the rules, and then everyone else took it and ran with it. And meanwhile, he's an old guy, and he's, you know, so uh, it's interesting. But Frenzy was daring in a lot of ways. But then Family Plot, and I tried to watch that just a couple of weeks ago. And and it doesn't. No. No. It doesn't fly. No. I actually thought, I, I watched it, you got to forgive me, I watched it 12 years ago. I, I found it very charming. It's a very charming um, movie. Um, and I, yeah, and it, and unless Cary Grant's in a Hitchcock movie, I'm not looking for charming. It's no, no, but like it's a, not a bad. It's not a bad. It's a Bruce Dern's good Karen Black. I mean, it's not a bad movie. It's, 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 give it a chance. Really give it another chance. I just watched it, it two weeks ago. <laughs> give it another I, chance. It's not a bad. It's, a, it's a, not a bad movie. It's actually. I, I actually like that I mean, movie quite a bit. I mean, you watched it 12 years ago. I watched it two weeks ago. So yeah, it, you need to give it a chance before I do. But. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. You know, but it actually plays movies. like a t- it actually plays like a TV movie for me. It, it does. It, it has a big TV movie feel to it, and that's that's the thing that that's a big minus to me. It's just not visual enough for me. But I mean, I want to mention you know a couple of other things. Frank Frenzy Capra, would have been a good movie to go out with, actually. That would have been <laughs> the best one. <laughs> Frank Capra's Pocket Full of Miracles. Uh, Alan Packer loves The Devil's Own. Mm. John Ford, uh, Seven oh Women. Uh-huh. Um, the uh, Devil's Own is not good. That's a bad. Yeah, yeah he but, died, but, but also, he died a horrible accident. Yeah, it's horrible. not a good way to go out. But and also, uh, I mean, a, a movie that uh, really uh, tortured him. You know, it was a torturous shoot that movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, we know because we talked to the screenwriter for our Pakula yeah. tribute. Yeah. But, yeah. but you got John Ford, Seven Women, uh, Sergey Einstein's. Uh, uh, I've been the terrible part one, and I've been the terrible part two. Didn't come out until '58, ten years after his death. Uh, uh, Michael Powell's Age of Consent from '69. Federico Fellini's Inter Vista, which really isn't his last movie. His last movie was The Voice of the Moon, which I've never even heard of. Yeah, I never. Um, yeah, I never heard of that one. Uh, George Cukor's Rich and Famous from '81. Robert Bresson's Largent from '83. Uh, uh, James Bridges' Bright Lights, Big City, which I know is talked about in the in the book. Um, and then, uh, you know, Stanley Kramer's The Runner Stumbles, Nora Ephron's Julie and Julia, and then Sam Peckinpah's The Awesome and Weekend, <laughs> which was interesting because he got that came about from Don Siegel's last film, Jinx. Yeah. Because he exactly. was Dan Peckinpah couldn't get work anywhere, and Don Siegel let him do um, second unit work for Jinx, and um, that led to the Osterman weekend. Actually, Jerry, did, you, like, did you have did you have yeah. movies on your list that uh, we have mentioned? No, we and, talked uh, about it. We talked about a couple of them. Um, the other one, uh, there's another one. Um, besides Alan, I brought. I just meant these aren't ones that necessarily like or anything. Just I wrote down. Um, there's like College of Brawls, uh, Inspector Bellamy, which was a couple mm-hmm. of years ago. Um, that was of Gerard Depardieu. Who, there's a picture of Gerard Depardieu in New York Magazine this mm-hmm. week, and I thought at first I thought it was Lena Dunham. So um, <laughs> keep, keep that in mind. Just keep that in mind. Um, there's Sidney, po- Sidney Pollock's The Interpreter, Tony Richardson's The Blue Sky. Um, oh, John which Sturges. is actually okay. I like that. Yeah, movie. John Sturges. <laughs> The Eagle Has Landed, and he made The Great Escape, all these great action movies. Um, yeah. So he, did, he ended on a it? high note. The Eagle Has Landed. Great, better book than movie, but still. Um, George Hinkenlooper, Casino Jack. Um, isn't, it, isn't, it the blue, isn't it Blue Skies? 
the Jessica Lane. Blue sky, sky, blue sky, blue sky, okay. blue sky. Um, and let me see. This Anthony Minghella is breaking and entering, which I wasn't crazy about, but um, yeah, with um, that, with Jude Law. <laughs> and I guess does this count last feature film? Blake Edwards, Son of the Pink Panther. Oh boy, I guess that counts. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And the other one is actually rather kind of is. Kinji Fukasada's, who did um, all the great Japanese gangster movies, um, and he did Battle Royale, and Battle Royale 2 was his last film that his son completed for him. Um, okay. Those are just some that I had on there. Okay. The last films of great directors. All right, we close off tonight with a piece of film score. John <laughs> Debney from the new movie The Call, starring Halle Berry. Oh, wow, okay. Will this be the last score from a great composer? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, okay. All right. All right. That's terrible. That's your, you are awful. Um. <laughs> All right. We'll be back next week with uh, director Susan Seidelman, uh, one of the great independent filmmakers of the 80s, was desperately seeking Susan and Cookie and making Mr. Wright and all kinds of great stuff. I love making <laughs> Mr. Wright. Yeah, she's got a new movie out called Musical Chair. She's going to talk to us about that. Actually, I'm in love with this conversation. It was a great time talking to her. And also, it's a very good movie too. <laughs> yeah, it is. And also, we'll be talking to Glenn Frankel. He's written a new book on the making of The Searchers, the John Ford classic, and another conversation I'm crazy about. So next week will be a great show. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank, thank you. you.